this is David Petrusha. I'm the author of 1920, The Year of the Six Presidents, and we're discussing that here today at the open house of the uh, Calvin Coolidge State Historic Site in beautiful, and I do mean beautiful, Plymouth Notch, Vermont. Okay, this time I'd like to invite up a uh, very special friend of the Coolidge Foundation, former governor of Vermont, Jim Douglas, who will be introducing our, our speaker today. Governor Douglas began his political career being elected to the Vermont House of Representatives after graduating from Middlebury College in 1972. After serving in various capacities for the state of Vermont, he ran for and was elected governor in 2002 and then re-elected three more times after that. He's a trustee of the Coolidge Foundation and an ever-popular guest of ours. So without any further ado, I present Governor Jim, Jim Douglas. John do here at uh, Foundation Headquarters in cooperation with our friends uh, at the Division for Historic Preservation. Um, poor Bill has to work on President's Day, a state holiday every year, but we're grateful that he does, so that we can have programs like this, and it is indeed a great public-private partnership that we enjoy with our friends at, uh, at the uh, historic site. I want to acknowledge my colleague on the Board of Trustees, Jenny Harville, who's uh, here. Uh, Jenny's a great granddaughter of the man himself, and we're delighted to have her um, uh, providing that uh, link to, uh, to our namesake and providing leadership on our board of trustees. So thank you for coming today, Jenny, as well. Thank you. Um, well, it is uh, President's Day, and although it started off as a, uh, an opportunity to acknowledge the first and 16th presidents, um, I think the other uh, uh, 42 deserve a little attention, and, and what better opportunity uh, then today to have a, a program about number 30, as we like to call him, uh, Calvin Coolidge, a native of this hamlet uh, and uh, uh, the leader of our country during the 1920s. Uh, it seems particularly appropriate that we have the program that we're offering today because it's the centennial of the national election that brought uh, Calvin Coolidge to the vice presidency after his very successful career as, uh, as a local and state official. And uh, we're delighted to have someone who has written about that important milestone in, in American history to share his thoughts and uh, offer to uh, sell you a book as well, uh, so that you'll be an expert about what happened uh, 100 years ago uh, this, this, this year. Uh, it was a different era, as I'm sure David will explain, in terms of presidential politics, and uh, perhaps one to which we uh, might aspire to return uh, <laughs> in some respects. We'll see what happens. David is a, a noted historian and, and author. He's edited three volumes uh, about uh, the work of uh, Calvin Coolidge. Uh, one is entitled Silent Cal's Almanac, the Homespun Wit and Wisdom of Vermont's Calvin Coolidge. Another is Calvin Coolidge, a documentary biography. And uh, thirdly, Coolidge on the Founders, Calvin Coolidge on the American Revolution and the Founding Fathers. And I know some of those volumes are for sale at the gift shop here as well. Right, Bill? Yes. So um, please uh, take, a, take a look there later if, if you would like to. Um, well, David Petruja has written about uh, American presidential elections uh, in other contexts as well. Um, and uh, I don't think there can be a better uh, chronicle of the year 1920 than uh, the one that he has prepared now, which is subtitled The Year of Six Presidents. And he can explain to us what that means. Uh, the book has uh, received a star review in Kirkus. It was, um, it was deemed one of the best books of 2007. The Wall Street Journal uh, rated this book as among the five best books on political campaigns. Uh, so it certainly received a share of accolades. That's why it was particularly important that David could uh, spend time with us today. Now, I guess another uh, focus in his, uh, uh, in his scholarship uh, beyond the presidential uh, history, uh, and that is baseball. Um, he was uh, president of the Society for American Baseball Research for four years. He was editor-in-chief of the publishing company Total Sports. Uh, he wrote a, a biography of the first commissioner of baseball, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, uh, entitled Judge and Jury. He received the 1998 Casey Award for that uh, 
book and was a finalist for the Seymour Medal, and he was nominated for the Nash Book Award, too. Uh, David uh, collaborated with Ted Williams uh, on his autobiography entitled Ted Williams, My Life in the Pictures. David Petruja has been interviewed on radio and TV and on all kinds of media through the years, and, and we're so thrilled that he could take time out of what's a busy schedule to join us at the Notch today. So I'm honored to introduce to all of you a uh, great friend of, of Calvin Coolidge and the Foundation here on President's Day. Let's welcome David Petruja. First off, how do you pronounce your last name? <laughs> the second question is, uh, is more specific, is why did you write this book? Which might be, you know, about any book I write. What, what caused you to do this one? And this one was because I was under option to do a new book. And I was rolling around some presidential trivia in my brain. And I thought, well, now in 1960, there were three presidents in play. There was Kennedy and Johnson and Nixon. And a year later, it's only Johnson that people become president. Or in 1968, Nixon and Reagan and no one else. But in 1920, all of a sudden, you've got six presidents in play. Six presidents running in one form or another active the presidency of the United States are on the ticket. And those six, uh, in chronological order, uh, are Theodore Roosevelt. Now, Theodore Roosevelt is not alive in 1920. He dies in January 1919. So how does he qualify? You know, it's like some people have pointed out, like on these Amazon reviews, well, you know, he's not alive in 1920. It's like, yes. Yes, I know that. I read Wikipedia too, okay? Uh, but, but if he were not felled by a heart attack in his sleep at Sagamore Hill uh, in 1919, he would have been the candidate. He had split the Republican Party wide open in 1912. The party was still not sure what to do with him in 1916, but being the great advocate of preparedness for our involvement in World War I and being proved right in many ways and being such a really hyper patriot um, and, and the era of World War I being of, of super patriotism, he's, he's the man. The country is ready to turn back to him and he's pretty much ready to go but his health uh, a uh, really a very bad result of the, his Amazon expedition where he got a jump of fever and all sorts of maladies, takes its toll. He has a heart attack uh, in January, in January 1919, and that leaves the field wide open for the Republicans. And we'll get to those, that Republican field later on. The next president uh, involved is Woodrow Wilson. Now Woodrow Wilson in 1919, had come back from Paris. He was going, he was really uh, going to push the League of Nations on the country. The country was drawing back from that. The Senate of the United States was not about to uh, ratify that treaty without major modifications, which he was not going to agree to. But he's going to force the Senate, he's going to force the country into ratifying this treaty, which is going to put America more and more into, into the world affairs, which we have drawn back from our whole history. You know, Washington you know, saying avoid, George Washington saying avoid uh, entangling alliances. So he goes on this big tour of the United States, and in Pueblo, Colorado, he's giving a speech and has a stroke right on the uh, platform. He's speaking gibberish, and they have to get him off the stage. They put him on a train back to Washington. He's not feeling well on the train. And then, and then, the first sentence in my book. The President of the United States lay bleeding on the bathroom floor. 
because he gets up in the middle of the night in the White House and has an even bigger stroke. Falls, hits his head on the sink, and is lying there bleeding. And he's going to be largely incapacitated as president for the rest of his term. But he's, he's a delusional kind of guy. Okay? He has an inflated impression of himself and his mission in the world. So in 1920, later on, we'll get to that as well, he's going to push for a third term, an unprecedented third term, much as, much as Theodore Roosevelt was angling towards, and had run for another term in, in 1912, but unsuccessfully. Then we come to a fellow who is going to make the trip, who is going to make it to the White House in 1920, and that's Senator Warren Gamaliel Harding of Ohio. Now, Harding is not one of the more remembered presidents in our history, and he was not the front runner in 1920. He had been lieutenant governor of Ohio, a state senator. He was a newspaper editor in an era where newspaper editors really took and overt part in electoral politics. Now, we don't do that anymore. We don't have anyone involved in the news media running for office anymore, uh, except for that Bloomberg guy, okay? <laughs> so maybe things haven't changed that much. But back then, you would have guys in politics think of a, a much more famous guy than Harding, a guy who had really the first multimedia empire, think Rupert Murdoch. Uh, William Randolph Hearst. He had run for president in 1904. He had been in Congress. So politics and publishing were, were much one and the same often in those cases. And Harding is starting out as a real long shot. He knows he's not the heir apparent to Theodore Roosevelt. In fact, he had spent some time really dissing Theodore Roosevelt in his newspaper during that 1912 campaign when the Republican Party was split, uh, which is kind of rare for Harding, because the, because the thing about Harding is, for all his faults, and he has faults, we know he has faults, we know he has mistresses, we now know he has, uh, for sure, we now know he had an illegitimate daughter, uh, but he's, he's sort of a nice guy and a, a conciliator. He wants to bring people together. And maybe in a fractured party, he's the guy to do it in 1920. Running besides the front runners in 1920 are a bunch of favorite sons. And the favorite son from Massachusetts is their governor. I, I think you know a little bit about him, Calvin Coolidge. He had been instrumental in setting up the Boston or settling the Boston strike in 1919, and as a law and order candidate at a time when an, uh, anarchists are, are throwing bombs at people and there's a lot of strikes and labor unrest, um, he is the beneficiary of a boom put forward by a department store owner in Massachusetts, in Boston, a guy named Frank W. Stone Stearns. Uh, nicknamed Lord Lingerie for one of the departments in his store. And uh, Stearns thinks he's the greatest thing since sliced bread and thinks that he can be president of the United States, Coolidge can. So Coolidge is in play, but he's resisting it, resisting it, resisting it. He's not cooperating with Stearns. He is not really um, making a play for the presidency and really discouraging it. And so you have Coolidge in play in 1920. Then we have chronologically a fellow named Herbert Clark Hoover. Hoover had been born and raised a Republican. He'd given money to the Progressive Party in 1912. He is the great Horatio Alger of American politics because he was an orphan boy in Iowa. He was sent to live with an uncle in Oregon with a thin dime sewn into his into his his jacket pocket, and he goes to Stanford. He's a member of the first graduating class. He's literally working his way, pushing a cart in a in in the mines of California and Nevada after graduating from college 
but he's, he's so smart and so good at mining and engineering, he's soon making his fortune in turning gold mines around in Australia and in China, and uh, even, even a sort of hero fighting back in, in the Boxer Rebellion. Um, so he's lonely, he's rich, he doesn't really have to do much of anything in 1914 when he's living in London and the World War breaks out and he helps get Americans back who are stranded in Europe because of the war. He may have even helped get my great-grandmother back. I've never heard anything directly about that, but he does it very efficiently because everything he does back then is very efficient. He helps uh, join the Woodrow Wilson administration during the war to administer food short to deal with food shortages during the war, and then after the war, feeds the starving people of Europe, as he had actually earlier in the war when he was feeding the starving people of Germany. But what is he? Is he, that, is he the Republican who grew up in Iowa? Is he the progressive who gave money to Theodore Roosevelt in 1912? Or is he a Democrat because he was working for Woodrow Wilson? He's always a big admirer of Wilson, but is he going to be running as a Democrat or as a Republican? But he's a very, very popular guy in 1920. And then the last guy chronologically, who actually in 1920 is last but least, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who is just Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He's tried to run for senator in New York State in 1914 and lost a Democratic primary. He's not Franklin D. Roosevelt ready for prime time yet. He's very ambitious. There's been a thing in the paper about him running for president. And he is going to propose through an intermediary after it has been proposed to him that there be on the Democratic ticket in 1920 a Hoover Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt ticket. But Herbert Hoover is going to turn that down. Roosevelt has his own problems. He's been a bit of an angler, a conniver in the uh, Wilson administration, a backstabber with his, with his boss. Uh, Josephus Daniels, but G Daniels is, is, by the way, another newspaper publisher, and he, um, when I worked for Total Sports, it was owned by his descendants, okay? So everything comes around, okay? So um, they were still running newspapers in North Carolina. But anyway, Josephus Daniels would have a great deal of patience with Franklin Roosevelt and, and always supported him even when Roosevelt was, was not doing his best. And he was often not, not doing his best around 1917 when he was having an affair with Lucy Mercer, which could have ended his political career. So it's not just Harding, but it's also Franklin Roosevelt who has these sort of side issues going on in 1920. 1920 is a year of great change. In America. The census says we're an urban nation for the first time. Now, the definition is very narrow. It means that like 51% of the country is now living in urban areas. Urban area being defined as someone, as an area of over 3,500 people. Okay? So it's not white, you know, not everyone is F. Scott Fitzgerald or a flapper dancing on a tabletop. Um, it's, and, and a lot of people living in big cities may be people coming up from sharecropping in the South, in Chicago, or from Eastern Europe, or Southern Europe, from some little village there. Uh, but nonetheless, the cities are getting bigger, the modernity is uh, approaching, and the old America is resisting. One of the ways they resist is in 1920, what goes into effect in January, National prohibition. Oddly enough, in 1920, it's not going to be a big issue in the political campaign. Both parties have signed on to it unenthusiastically, uh, but it's here, and it looks like it's here to stay because who repeals constitutional amendments? So like nobody. Not going to happen. Then you have the Ku Klux Klan, which is rising up. It's not quite there yet where it's going to be in a few years, but it's gearing up. One of the things which helps it is, you know, um, sometimes 
you know, as they say, no publicity is bad publicity. There are two big exposés run on the Klan in 1920. One by the New York World, a very famous uh, Democratic, liberal, progressive newspaper, and they run an expose, and then there's a congressional expo uh, investigation. And this actually provides great publicity for the Klan. It's like people say, hmm, not bad. Okay, we'll join that. We'll give you $10 and get a, a new sheet, okay, to wear, because that's what it costs. Also, it's uh, fundraising going on. Um, they had hired the Klan, but it was not going well until they hired professional fundraisers. And they got a cut. The uh, previous um, uh, client for these fundraisers was the Theodore Roosevelt Association. So they were kind of respectable people, but they got, they got a big cut, and membership goes up, up, up in the, for the Klan in 1920. Um, so all of these things are going on. The restriction of immigration has started. There's a law in 1917 where you have to be able to read or write, you have to be literate to come into the country. The big restrictions are not going to come in formally until 1922 or 1924. But really, they started because of the war. Because of the war. Because you can't get there from here. You can't get from Europe to America anymore. So America is changing, and the automobile is coming in. Uh, there's a big unrest in the country. There are labor unions striking all over the place from telegraph operators and coal miners and actors. Actors are going on strike. Now to deal with these strikes, one of the, a fellow who's going to be brought in is going to be one of the front runners for the Republican nomination. His name is Leonard Wood. Leonard Wood was a doctor who went into the military, won a medal of honor for chasing after the Indians in the Southwest. And when he comes back to Washington, he comes like this with Theodore Roosevelt in the 1890s. And they are together at San Juan Hill in the uh, Spanish-American War when Theodore Roosevelt charges up and become a national hero. OK. So um, he is a front runner. Uh, he had been for preparedness as much or more than Theodore Roosevelt, but he seems to be sort of like, he's a little too much law and order. He's a little too much the man on horseback for 1920. So he's the natural heir of Roosevelt, but he's got some issues. His big contender is a fellow named Frank Lau from Illinois. He's the governor. He's a very capable guy. And what derails both of them is campaign finance reform and spending too much money on campaigns, particularly in the case of, um, of Leonard Wood, who is spending a fortune and also going into races where he should, he should stay away from, from challenging some of these favorite sons. But he's spending too much, and this becomes a scandal. This triggers a congressional investigation. And the congressional investigation, which is requested by Hiram Johnson, who is the favorite son from California, it's kind of an ornery, progressive guy. Uh, it's, um, it was said of him that he always looked like he was an ill-tempered baby, and he often acted like it. But he had been Theodore Roosevelt's running mate in 1916. He's running, he's sort of like the number three guy in 1920. He asked for an investigation of campaign spending, and what they discover in the course of this is that some checks have gone to delegates in Missouri and St. Louis from the Loudoun campaign. And all of a sudden, Loudoun, who is a very clean candidate, looks dirty. He had nothing to do with it, but you get blamed for the underlings. So now, would that Loudon are tarnished, and even Johnson are tarnished, is tarnished because the other guys are mad at him for triggering this investigation. And then you have all the uh, favorite son candidates like Calvin Coolidge and Warren Harding, who is <coughs> maybe the fourth or fifth favorite of ever, anyone. And this is a conscious strategy. It's not a conscious strategy to be so not quite popular of Harding, 
but to lay low, to like in a horse race. Say you're in a horse race and you hang back, and you hang back and then you make your move after the other horses have run themselves into exhaustion. And this, this is the Harding strategy and the strategy of his campaign manager, a guy named Harry Doherty. They know he's not gonna be anyone's favorite, but at the end of the day, things could, could change. Now, as the Republicans gather in Chicago, that's exactly what happened, where the front runners beat themselves into a pole. And Doherty doesn't even, you know, they, they bring a band from Columbus, Ohio, to serenade the delegates, and they won't even play rah-rah Harding songs. They, they don't even want to be that up front or in your face to the other candidates. They're just waiting. Doherty had said, allegedly, to the New York Times, that at the end of the day, everyone's going to be deadlocked, and after 10 ballots, the Republican bigwigs are going to meet in a smoke-filled room, and they're going to turn to Warren Harding. And remarkably, this is exactly what happens. Okay? Except it's not exactly what happens, and it's not exactly what he said. Because the reporter, I think you, I think we've been in situations where reporters put words in your mouth. Oh, never. <laughs> never. Never happened to me either. I was on the city council once. Once was enough. I don't know what you were thinking of being governor for the times. But anyway, so uh, the New York Times, I believe it was, said to Doherty, do you think this is going to happen? Blah, 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 blah. And he's running out of the room to catch a train or something. He goes, yes. And it's printed that that's his prediction. But um, actually, they don't really turn to Harding to force him on the convention, the big shots. It's just they've got no one else to, to turn to. And then they go and they see how the delegates are going to respond. And the delegates do respond after a couple more ballots to Harding, and they nominate him. And Harding has no clear choice who's going to be the vice president. As late as 1952, with Eisenhower and Nixon, Eisenhower really didn't pick Nixon. The guys in the back room, Tom Dooley really did. It, you know, they would often leave it up to the uh, convention to see who the other guys wanted, who the other factions wanted. So Harding leaves it up to his uh, allies, and they say it should be Irvine Lenglu, a kind of progressive senator from Wisconsin. And as the balloting proceeds for Lenglu, what happens is a judge, Wallace McCammon from Oregon, stands up on a chair, and they think he's going to put another second up for Lenroot, and instead he says, we were sent here as delegates for Henry Cabot Lodge for vice president. We were instructed in primary for vice president in Oregon. And he says, but there's another great guy from Massachusetts, and this guy should be the vice president, and his name is Calvin Coolidge. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> the supposedly completely lost convention of 1920 stampedes as no convention ever has and nominates Calvin Coolidge in a rush. Now, let us turn back a little way. Um, before Harding was really in the race, his wife, Florence Harding, went to a fortune teller, Madame Marshall, in Washington, D.C. <laughs> And she went with two other senators' wives. And they said, oh, Madam Marshall, will one of our presidents be president of the United States? Madam Marshall says, it will be you, Mrs. Harding. But I foresee tragedy. I foresee death, perhaps by poison. <laughs> And so, and now we return to the 1920 Republican Convention in Chicago, where in the press box, Edna Ferber, the novelist, wrote, you know, uh, show a uh, giant and uh, all these great plays with George for uh, Kaufman, uh, is going, oh no, not, you know, not Harding, you know, for president and. Uh, a reporter named McNutt turns to her and says, don't worry about it. Harding's life is not worth a plug nickel. 
because of the Coolidge lock. Coolidge is going to end up being president and Harding will die. Earlier, one of the people that the Republican Party could have turned to was Charles Evans Hughes, their 1916 uh, nominee. And he was asked at one point, he was, um, like Calvin Coolidge in 1923, he was visited by a family tragedy. His daughter had died. And so he was, he was not about to go for another run for anything. But a, uh, an attorney from New York went to him and said, please, tell, please, please run. And Hughes says, no, I'm not going to run. Don't mention my name at the convention. Don't do anything to get me to run. Because whoever is elected, will not finish out his term. There are all these, these, these strange prescient things going on about what's going to happen to the winner in 1920. But Warren Hardy is the winner at that convention. He is running with Calvin Coolidge. And who are they going to face? Now, Woodrow Wilson was sick of the White House. And he's got two terms in. He can barely get out of his wheelchair. He's not shaving half the time. At one point, the Congress uh, sends two senators to check in on what's happened to the President of the United States. And uh, one of them is Albert B. Fall, who's going to become Interior Secretary under Harding and go to jail. Um, he's a Republican, and the Democrats call him Hitchcock. And they go to see uh, Wilson, and Fall says to him, Mr. President, I want you to know, we've all been praying for you. And Wilson says, which way? <laughs> so Wilson has his good day that day. Okay, you have your good days and your bad days. It's a good day. And the senators go back and say, well, I guess he's still functioning as president, which he's not. But he won't get out of the way. He won't say whether he's running or not running. The guy who really wants him to get out of the way and can't force him out of the way is his former Secretary of the Treasury and current son-in-law, William Gibbs McAdoo. McAdoo is a progressive, he's a dry, he's for prohibition. He's, he's been a very capable guy during the, the war. Not particularly popular with his fellow cabinet members, but that's a question of personality rather than ideology. But he can't really push his way in. He's in, he's out, he's in, I'm running, I'm not running. He can't get really started as a candidate because his father-in-law won't say whether he's running or not. One guy who's less shy is A. Mitchell Palmer. A. Mitchell Palmer was the attorney general. He had these Palmer raids on radicals during the war, and he's running. Now, once the, uh, the radicals and the anarchists start throwing bombs at people, and what really, the, the, they're not, Socialist or communist, they're 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 animals. and they mail out a whole bunch of bombs to people like Kennesaw Mountain Landis, and they send out a bomb to the mayor of Seattle, where there had been a big general strike. Now, the bomb starts leaking in Seattle; it's leaking acid. So the bomb has not been blown up. So the police can see what sort of packaging it came in and from where it came. If one of these bombs had gone off, it was sent to a former senator from Georgia, and it was delivered to, or his maid, his uh, black maid picked it up and it went off in her hands, blew her hands off. You know, terrible, terrible stuff here. But this one bomb had not gone off, and they see it came from New York, and it had um, been labeled from Gimbel's, Novelties, Gimbel's department store. There's a guy reading about this in the subway not long afterwards. He works in the post office, the big post office in back of Penn Station. And he said, wait a minute, we got a big stack of those things in the, light, in the, in the post office. And they're all there marked insufficient postage. So thanks to the inefficiency of the post office department and the cheapness of the anarchists, many lives were saved. <laughs> but they decide, well, if, if we can't mail these things out, and there's no FedEx yet, what are we going to do? Let's hand deliver them. So they go and, uh, and they send off some bombs in Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. 
and they send one by a courier to address the home of A. Mitchell Palmer. And we know he gets as far as the middle of three steps because that's where the crater is. It went off in his hands, blew this fellow to pieces, and there's carnage all over the sidewalk, and part of his scalp lands on the roof of the house across the street. That is the home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, okay? Who are out for the evening, but rush back in the middle of all this. Uh, the, uh, Franklin uh, goes in, rushes his oldest, you know, grabs his son, sees how you are, and Eleanor says, what are you all doing up so late? <laughs> so uh, anyway, that was, that's the situation with A. Mitchell Palmer. He's running, he's a controversial figure. Al Smith is a candidate. Um, and Franklin Roosevelt shows up. It, the, the convention is in San Francisco. Frank, the, the hotels are, are tight in San Francisco. So where does Franklin Roosevelt lodge? At a battleship. He just commandeers a suite in a battleship, which uh, he stays in there until his boss shows up and says, and, and is told, no, you can't have this battleship. Your assistant is, has this battleship. And then Chip Daniel says, okay, get out. Roosevelt moves to another battleship where he proceeds to pretty much violate the prohibition amendment by serving uh, booze to all the New York delegates to the National Convention. He's going to be supporting McAdoo at first. <laughs> He's going to be talking about the, the usual uh, uh, hypocrisy or the wanted hypocrisy during prohibition. So Roosevelt is doing that. After a while, as uh, he's going to also vote a bit for Al Smith. He's going to vote once for uh, John W. Davis, who ran in 1924 against Coolidge and was Wilson's uh, solicitor general. He was getting punchy. They were all getting punchy because it goes like 44 or 46 ballots. Finally, the fellow who gets the nomination for the Democrats is a fellow I haven't mentioned because the exact same thing which was going on in the Republican process is going on in the Democratic process. You have a guy who is like everybody's fourth or fifth choice, who is from Ohio, who has statewide office there, he's the governor, and is a newspaper editor. He's the exact uh, carbon copy Democrat of Warren Harding. So as the Democrats beat each other to a pulp, they eventually turned to him after all these ballots. He was the candidate of the bosses. He was the candidate of Tammany in New York and Chicago and the Democrat boss in Indiana. He gets it, and who do you like? But they ask him, who do you like? And he says, I like this Franklin Roosevelt kid. And Tammany, which had fought Roosevelt the whole time, says, okay, you can have him. And one of the reasons Tammany says you can have him is we don't want him running for statewide office in New York. We want him to go be vice president and we want to bury him there. This theory did not work for Theodore Roosevelt, but it's like, well, let's try it again. So Democrats try to bury Franklin Roosevelt that way. The campaigns vary. Cox and Roosevelt are absolutely frenetic. Cox goes all over the country, and Roosevelt goes all over the country. Democrats don't have a lot of money, but Franklin Roosevelt's mother does, so she gives him five thousand dollars to for to to buy a, to rent a train for the campaign, and he, he does reasonably well impressing people on on his campaign trail. But he makes a mistake when he says to people. Um, because one of the criticisms of the League of Nations is this. America's going to have one vote. Britain, and there are a lot of people who don't like the British Empire then, largely Irish, okay, uh, is going to have six votes. They're going to have Britain, they're going to have Canada, they're going to have South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, you know? So they're going to have all these votes, so we're going to have one. We're going to have Uncle Sap is getting schnookered again, okay? So Roosevelt goes on the stump and says, well, how do you think these Central American republics are going to vote? 
just as we tell them to. And I know because I've written the constitutions for a couple of them, which isn't exactly true, but some of these countries were essentially our client states. But you don't go bring this up in public. This is not diplomatic. So when he's caught on this, giving speeches like in Montana on this, he does the political thing. He lies about it <laughs> and denies it. Um, but eventually there are all sorts of witnesses produced and, and he is forced to, well, sort of, or sort of forced to be caught lying about it. But otherwise it goes fairly well in the campaign stuff. Harding runs the front porch campaign. So everyone comes to Marion, Ohio, his home, on special trains, all sorts of groups, all sorts of ethnic groups, all sorts of racial groups. I think he had the black Methodists, Methodists in, in the morning, and the, or the, uh, and the black Baptists in, in the afternoon, okay? And, and the Italians and the Poles, and the butchers, the bakers, the candlestick makers. He has Al Jolson come in. Six, 100,000 people come onto his front lawn. And he does fairly well with that strategy. Eventually he goes on the road because the act wears thin, does okay speaking, changes his position on the League of Nations. And one of the things about Harding is this. He is, the Republican Party is very split on the League of Nations. And it is split with Theodore Roosevelt and Taft. This is a party which is, which is, it, the damn Republicans are acting like Democrats, okay? So, um, you've got people like Hiram Johnson and William E. Bora who are irreconcilable. They don't want any part of the League of Nations. Guys who are in the middle and they say, well, if you have put these reservations in, we'll sign on. And then people like William Howard Taft who are very much for the League of Nations. Herbert Hoover, very much for the League of Nations. Harding keeps all of these guys on board. And it would have been very easy to get the, the progressives from the West to jump the party again. But he, he, he's very good politically that way, bringing people on. He also does something which is uh, interesting. When Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, is named as uh, uh, Cox's running mate, he asks Cox, um, say, uh, when you're president, which is like not gonna happen, but when you're president and I'm vice president, can I sit in on the cabinet meetings? No, no one, no vice president been, had done this before. This is one reason why Wilson's vice president had not taken over. And Cox says, no, no, you can't Franklin Roosevelt. But Warren Harding, on his own, brings it up to Calvin Coolidge. And that's how Calvin Coolidge uh, gets to be uh, the uh, first vice president to sit in on the cabinet meetings. So he's sort of prepared to become president in August 1923. Now, uh, Coolidge is going to go on the road, and he doesn't want to go on the road. They keep asking him, go and campaign. Go and campaign for the ticket, you know. It's it's sort of like expected to campaign. And he says he's very Coolidge-like and actually petulant, you know, writing to his father, I don't want to go. I've got stuff to do. I am the governor of Massachusetts. I have a day job. <laughs> and finally, and what I think one of the reasons he doesn't want to go is because where they send him. They send him to the South. They send him to Richmond. They send him to the border state. You know, they don't send it anywhere important except to New York City. They have a huge parade in New York City where, where he is, is a part of. But then again, it's New York City. Even then, it's, it's very, very Democrat. So the election is, is held. And uh, one of the things which occurs towards the end of it is the racial issue gets thrown in. Where Democrats from Ohio uh, sent around hundreds of thousands of circulars around the country alleging that Warren Emanuel Harding is a black man, is, is, has some uh, black Negro blood in him. And Warren Harding doesn't quite know how to respond. He says to uh, an aide, you know, one of my ancestors could have jumped the fence. I don't know. 
And there's also the question of how do you respond? If you respond and if you're really vehement about it, if you're really, shall we say, catch up, as they used to say, offended, how do black voters respond to that? Okay, so he keeps his powder dry. The issue sort of goes by the boards in the last couple of weeks of the election. And the election is just great for the Hardy Coolidge ticket. 62% of the popular vote. This is the highest popular vote total to history at that point. Teddy Roosevelt was pretty darn popular in 1904 with 56% of the vote. And Ulysses S. Grant with about 55. But Warren Hardy tops them all. He carries every county in New England, which means he carries Boston. He carries every county in New York and Michigan and about a dozen other states. He carries 159 assembly districts in the state of New York. The only one he doesn't carry is Al Smith's. Um, the Republicans get pick up like 60 House seats, 10 Senate seats. They elect the second woman to ever go into the House of Representatives, who is a woman named Alice Robertson, who runs a diner in Oklahoma and is opposed to women's suffrage. That's how Republican a year it is, okay? And she never goes out of her diner to campaign even. She just like buys people bowls of soup or something and she gets she gets it. Uh, so it is, it is a remarkable year for the Republicans. Of course, uh, elections have consequences. We know that Warren Harding dies in August 1923, which is how Cal becomes president and then Hoover will succeed him. But there's also a consequence which, which is maybe even more far-reaching. In 1932, when Franklin Roosevelt is governor of New York, he's laying in bed and he gets a visitor. And it's that fellow who he had discussed being part of the Hoover-Roosevelt ticket with. And that fellow had said, you know, you should run for vice president. And Roosevelt didn't want to, and finally he did. And Roosevelt has strewn about him on the bed a bunch of little index cards. And he says to this visitor, he says, you remember when you asked me to run for vice president? Well, I ran for vice president, and these index cards are all people I met going around the country in 1920 on that losing race. And that is how I built my machine and my organization and how I became president in 1932. So that run of presidents, those six presidents, take you all the way from 1901 from 19, to 1945 and really influence the whole first half of the uh, history of the United States of America and of, and of the world. So an election which people think, well, that wasn't very important or interesting, I would submit it really is. Thank you. <laughs>
left a bad taste in the, in the public's mouth. I suspect people remember that. And that's one of the things that poisoned, um, it poisoned Hearst's 1904 presidential run. And also when Hearst was running for governor of New York, Theodore Roosevelt sent his Secretary of State and Secretary of War, L. Q. Root, up to a, give a speech in Utica, which really stuck the knife into Hearst for that comment. So be careful, be careful what you say about those things because even before Twitter, you know, they'll, <laughs> they'll hold you accountable. Yes. Now, I have two questions. I'm trying to decide which one to ask. Well, well we can go around again. <laughs> oh, okay, going back to the to the issue of the what I'll just say the predictions of death. Yeah, it's very easy. You know, all sorts of people make all sorts of crazy predictions, and of course we remember the ones that turn out to be yeah. you know in hindsight turn out to be prescient. I'm just wondering, is it just was there really any significance to these few? I think you mentioned three incidents, maybe four. Of, it's more than usual. Uh, here's here's a here's a here's a bonus fact to it. When Florence Harding and the two senators' wives go to uh, Madame Marshall, someone else had gone to her a few years earlier, and she now I don't know if she, she told this to as they used to say. I bet you say that to all the boys. <laughs> I don't know if she said that to all the girls, but at one point. A woman came in and she said to her, you will be first lady of the United States. This is, and that woman was Edith Bowling Gallup, who became the second Mrs. Woodrow Wilson after, after the first Mrs. Wilson died. And I suspect when this uh, prediction was made on that count that the first Mrs. Wilson was still alive. And she went pretty quickly. Uh, but no, I don't think, I don't think people were, were making much of those predictions then because they really weren't public predictions. These things come out, you know, I don't think Florence Harding was talking about that. Although um, she, she got weird right after the nomination too, when she was sitting you know, up, in the, up in the box in the galleries with Harry Daugherty, the campaign manager. And, and she thought it was, it was the tragedy was, was coming. There was just something, something, something in the air about about Harding and, and the 1920 election, yeah. But nothing was made publicly, and say the the conversation with uh, Charles Evans Hughes was made to this very obscure lawyer, who in fact at one point was an attorney for a, another guy I wrote the book about, which is how I think I found this out a guy that, uh, who was an attorney for the gangster, Arnold Rothstein. I mean, it makes no sense that Charles Rock, Evan Hughes would be talking to a, a gangland lawyer, but he was. Uh, so, uh, as again, so many things come around and connect, we don't think will connect. Yes, anyone else? Then go do it again. Go once, go uh, on twice. With, you, you, you mentioned that there were I'll say whispers that Harding was black or part black. Yes. Now, more recent times, uh, when Ed Koch was running for governor, there were whisper, you know, whisperings that he was oh, yeah. gay, and with Barack Obama, whisperings that he was a Muslim. Are these were those similar or, or different from uh, the, the claims that, that Harding was gay? Oh, was was black. I think you always get. I think that was rare back then. I mean, the circumstances would have been unique, I think. You, you, you had this fellow, William Esterbrook Chancellor, who was fairly well-respected academic. He had been, I think, superintendent of schools in Washington, D.C., and worked for one of the, the colleges in Ohio. But on this subject, he was just off his rocker and, and became obsessed with this idea where he, he would, you know, make a statement that looking at Harding's father, that this man clearly is black. And it's like, no, he's not. 
I mean, it's like, what are you looking at? What, are you, what, what, what is in your brain to, to come up with this stuff? And supposedly he had interviewed hundreds of people in the area where the Hargins had come from. And he was able to come up with three people that he could name. And their testimony, if you could call it testimony, would probably be thrown out of court. So there's almost, almost nothing there except his, his own obsession. The, uh, the party in, oh, the Democrat Party in Ohio, and the situation in Ohio is sort of interesting too. If you take a look in the 20s, which state produced the most number of Klan members? It was Ohio. Okay. Um, and at another point, during the campaign, Cox goes to California. He's making a swing around. And um, in California, the big issue was the uh, Chinese and Asian exclusion, OK? And he makes the statement, I think, after he gets back to Ohio, that this is a white man's country. Okay, so this this is this is again uh, what, what I'll say to people about one of the lessons, or you know, I was asked beforehand by uh, the TV uh, crew that was here. You know, what do you, what do you hope people will take away from uh, the book and from any of my books? It's like don't think you're going to get like this this straight left right continuum through history because you're not. Say as I said about suffrage you know, Republican, Democrat, or Prohibition, which is, you know, Prohibition is largely, largely a progressive measure, and, and not so much. So you get the more progressive people, again, like Hiram Johnson and Bora, are real, you know, knock down, drag out Prohibitions, where the Republican Party in the Northeast, which is then conservative, you know, it's not moderate, the conservatives are, the Republican Party are in the East, they tend to be really very much opposed to, to prohibition. And, and, and who's the big, who is the, the politician who is the most pro-prohibition? It's William Jennings Bryan, who's a populist. And working, Theodore, uh, Franklin Roosevelt working for Josephus Daniels, a very close Bryan ally, a real populist, um, and again, What's, what's the continuum of, of Josephus Daniels? What are the three things you, you check off for him? Populist, racist segregationist, prohibitionist, okay? So you, know, you see things zigging and zagging, and often, often geographically, but uh, you know, don't think you're gonna pigeonhole people you know, one way or the other back then as you might now. Yes, sir. I think I'm right to say this was, the 1920 uh, election would have been the first one in which women could vote, am I right? Yes. So how did that play out? Uh, ah, well, let's, let's talk about how we finally got there because I left out that. So the Republicans had uh, voted for it overwhelmingly in Congress, the Senate, um, in terms of calling special legislative sessions, state legislators voting for it. But at the, you see suffragettes picketing the Republican convention in 1920 and saying, you're not for women's suffrage. And the reason for that is to get over the top, to get it ratified by the states before the 1920 election, there were only a few states left in play. The southern states had almost uniformly said no, okay? So you had Connecticut, and they, th they thought that, like, oh, I think Florida maybe, certainly Tennessee, North Carolina still had yet to vote on it. And also Connecticut and Vermont. And the two governors in Vermont, in Connecticut and Vermont, were Republicans and were not calling special sessions, okay? The special session gets called in North Carolina, and eventually it gets knocked down, and it goes down to Tennessee in August. So we were really cutting close. 
And the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the, the State House in Tennessee had been for suffrage until Bush came down to Shishaw, when he actually had to vote on it. And then he says, uh, I changed my mind. I'm not for it. And he lines up all the votes, so suffrage is going to fail in his house by one vote. Now, the supporters and the opponents of women's suffrage would wear roses in their lapels. A white rose or a red rose would be one thing, a yellow rose would be another. So there's a 23-year-old representative from East Tennessee, very historically Republican area. This is Sergeant York, you know, kind of hillbilly area. This has been remarkably consistently Republican forever. So, so he's he's coming there, and he's wearing the rose which says, "I'm opposed to prohibition or to women's suffrage." And he stands up early in the vote, and his name is Byrne, Harry Byrne. And he says, you can all see this rose in my lapel, so you, you know what that means. But you cannot see the letter in my breast pocket from my mother. And she has written to me, Harry, cast a vote for women to get the vote. And he said, says, I vote, I. And the place goes wild because they can count the votes and they know the game is over. Women are going to get the vote that year. And they are, they, it creates such a pandemonium. He has to run up in the attic for safety. <laughs> <laughs> and he's not sure he's going to be, he's, he's not sure he's, he's going to be reelected that year. He, you know, because he's a flip-flopper, okay? And he, he also has a wife to support you know, by the time of the election, whose maiden name was Reagan, by the way. And uh, so, uh, but he is reelected. Again, it's a Republican year. And so, but your question was, how do women vote? Um, the, one of the reasons why they, they vote, we have hard statistics for one state. And we, we don't, and I'm not talking exit polling. The state of Illinois we broke down the votes of how men voted and women voted for each candidate, okay? We also have some data from, from the Boston area where we saw that in the Democratic area, the votes in, the, in the, uh, those precincts did not go up that much. You know, they should have doubled, okay? Uh, but in the Republican areas, they did. Now, part of that is it was a Republican year. So Republicans are responding with more enthusiasm than the Democrats. Uh, so, but in Illinois, we see that women vote more for Harding, okay? Now, um, Harding, what was that? Harding was a, uh, you know, a handsome guy. They say he looked like a president. And, you know, he's, he, just, he just is, so he's like, you know. And as we know about his personal life, this guy's a chick magnet, okay? <laughs> And as I write about James Middleton Cox, he looks like a Midwestern sack of potatoes. <laughs> okay, uh, so you know there might have been something going on with that. But I, 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 I you know, but, but on the other hand, uh, I, I, I hesitate to say this here, but Franklin Roosevelt uh, was better looking than uh, Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> but I guess it was the top of the ticket that was the draw that year. So any, anyone else? <laughs> Okay, I guess that's it. Oh, you have a question. How did he die? How did Hardy die? How did Hardy die? Because I'm not down for this. Very yeah, well, Harding is, um, Harding makes the same, well, what happens is that, you know, presidents would, would try not to travel that much. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what kills, what kills presidents often is when they go on the road. Talk about your, your historical precedents. When uh, James Garfield is shot, he's in the train station. He's getting out of the Dodge, okay? And he's, he's shot in the back. And then McKinley is shot when he's in Buffalo. Wilson is stricken when he's on his big tour around the country. 
which is, you know, not something the presidents were doing much of back then. Now, Harding makes the same mistake of going on this big nationwide tour. In fact, he's the first president to go to Canada. He goes to Vancouver on his way to Alaska. Why does he go to Alaska? Because his wife always wanted to go to Alaska, okay? <laughs> but she had been sick. She was the one who was supposed to die first because she had real terrible kidney disease and was laid up in the White House for about a year. But she gets better and election year is coming in 1924, and it's 1923, and he goes on this big tour and he starts to wear himself out as well. Now, some people think he got seafood poisoning up in the uh, Northwest. And by the time he gets to San Francisco, he's like really dragging, and he has to be put to bed in a, in a hotel in San Francisco. Now, um, the, uh, it's not seafood power poisoning, it's a heart attack. And the doctors give conflicting um, diagnoses. For one thing, it, I was str struck by the fact that people didn't really know that there were things as heart attacks back then. They thought they were strokes. Everything was a stroke or apoplexy. They didn't know your heart could just, you know, give out like that. But if, if Harding being a handsome man, he's a handsome man straight on. But if you take a look at him full figure in profile, he looks a lot like William Howard Taft. He has a big gut on him. One of the things which caused him to draw back from uh, running in 1920, they asked him uh, in his smoke-filled room, is there anything where you shouldn't be president or running? And instead of saying, why no, he says, and 10 minutes later he gets back to him. You know, he wasn't a crook, but you know, there were the women problems, the mistresses, the girlfriends, uh, but also his health wasn't all that good. His blood pressure was very high then. Um, he had blood in his urine. Um, he had been uh, sent to the uh, rest home when he was a young man in Battle Creek, what would be called sanitarium. Uh, so he, he, had, he had some health problems and he just gives out and dies in bed. He was reading a newspaper profile of him, or his wife was reading it to him in bed, I think the Saturday Evening Post or one of those, those old magazines. And it was like a, a, a view of a sane man, but, you know, the sort of normalcy president. And he says, that's, that's good, go on. And those were his last words, and, and he dies. And when he, when he comes back, because he, he dies at the greatest distance of any president from dying in, you know, even more so than Franklin Roosevelt. You know, you think about those, those newsreels of Franklin Roosevelt going back to Washington uh, and the emotion which people felt. People felt as much emotion about Warren Harding as the trains, the trains would stop in the middle of the night. And in these little small towns, there would be people all, all gathered around. At the time of his death, he was very, very popular. Uh, but but that's, that's how he died. And But the rumors get started, well, was he poisoned? Again, that prophecy, he might die by poison, uh, by his wife. And, I heard that. And there were issues, you know, there were issues between them. Uh, but, uh, you know, it was a political partnership. And there was something between them. Her story, her story is, um, she was uh, the daughter of one of the richest men in Marion, Ohio. And she uh, falls for this guy who, shall we say, was a cad. I'm not talking about Warren. I'm talking about someone else. So she either, she, and she uh, had a child by him. And maybe they weren't even married. They, no one can find the marriage certificate. And she comes back at Christmas Eve in a snowstorm on a train. She has to beg the conductor to be able to travel on this train. She has no money. And she's going to her father, the richest man in town, to say, please take care of me and my child, your grandchild. And he says, no, 
I will take care of my grandchild, but you will take care of yourself. You, as the, you have disgraced the family. And she goes off and supports herself as a piano teacher. A single mom, piano teacher, you know, before the turn of the century, and she sets herself on the handsomest young guy in town. And he, she was, he was younger than her, and she lands him. And so, so her, her story is very interesting, too. Go to YouTube and watch uh, my, uh, my talk on her uh, for C-SPAN. <laughs> but anyway, I think I'm supposed to shut up. <laughs> so thank you all for coming.